right, everyone, welcome to the last lecture uh, of the Factory Systemology and TFT course. So um, I just wanted to have some other references up on the board. Uh, I don't have a fancy list like Adrian does, so uh, I need to give you other. We already had a lot of different names and people on the board, uh, which I did not repeat here. But there are some, some people I wanted to mention, uh, in particular, uh, these first two guys, because their blob homology actually was a, um, appeared earlier than topological curl homology, factorization homology, uh, and, and is, is, is closely related, but it's a, a, a different framework. Um, and then there were many applications of factorization homology and ideas of factorization homology to different, different themes. And um, I have to admit that I kind of focused on the younger people here. So uh, if, if I forgot somebody, please, please do let me know. I'd really like to add them to the list and just tell me now or later. Hmm? Unless they're old. No, but, <laughs> but I really wanted to, you know, th these are all a bit, bit younger. I wanted to really <laughs> have their names out there. <laughs> Okay, so what did I promise you? I promised you on Monday that I would talk about dualizability, and now's the last day, and I haven't said anything about dualizability yet. So um, that's left for today. So remember, we had the definition of an object having a dual uh, on Monday, and so now dualizability is a generalization of this definition. Uh, so let's, let's recall, first of all, this is a class about TFT, so why will we be talking about dualizability? And the reason is um, the famous Cabordism hypothesis, which will be up on the board in a moment. So let me repeat the definition from yesterday, a fully extended framed n-dimensional topological field theory is a symmetric monoidal. So, so far it was the same as for a TFT, but it's a functor, symmetric monoidal functor now, not of categories, but of infinity n categories. So, well, symmetric monoidal n categories, of course, board and framed to C. So I did not tell you what symmetric monoidal means. And I'm happy to talk about this separately, but um, for purposes of time, uh, we won't dwell on this here. And the bordism category is the bordism category that we saw on Wednesday, um, except that we did not discuss how to put the framings here. We did see how to put framings on n manifolds. So hopefully you can piece these pieces of information together. Um, so note again that this bordism category is an infinity n category. So my top morphisms, that's the dimension here. N morphisms are N bordisms, and then we go down all the way to points, or points thought of as little RMs with a frame. <coughs> okay, so again, in this definition, this target C can vary quite a bit. Okay, so and part of the game is to choose a nice target. So we saw a possible target yesterday. We had explicitly constructed one of these things coming from factorization homology. We had discussed a particular target here, but by all means, that's not a unique choice. And there's a lot we could say about how to choose targets and so on, but not in this class. But why, why now these? Why do we really want these guys? Well, that's the cobordism hypothesis. So hopefully you saw that um, we're trying to write down this explicit functor coming from factorization homology, and well, 
there was actually something non-trivial to do. Like it was not that straightforward to actually write this down. And the Cortison hypothesis, so and we, but we were in a situation where actually it was nice that we could do the same thing on objects, morphisms, and so on. The, the assignment was always the same. But this was very specific to this particular TFT. That won't be true in general. In general, you will have to really specify everything and check coherences, check diagrams commuting, and so on. Or maybe they don't commute on just up to homotopy because in infinity n category, that's fine. But anyway. Um, so instead, uh, what's a very useful tool for these fully extended frames and dimensional topological field theories is the cobordism hypothesis. And so this actually backs by from below. And at this point, after this class, I really strongly encourage you to actually go and look at this original paper. Because to me, every time I open my paper, it's just amazing how, like, in the 90s, they basically found the right condition and kind of all exactly what the structure is, even though all this infinity n stuff wasn't there yet and hadn't been developed and so on, but to me this is really beautiful. And um, then, right, so then there was um, a first version of proof for n equals 2 by Hopkins and Lurie, which is unpublished, and then there's a very nice expository paper by Lurie where he gives a very extensive sketch of proof how to prove this thing. So this is the paper that we've been citing also for the Fortson category and so on and so forth. And again, this is a, especially if you start at the beginning, it's very, very readable. And you will learn a lot of the things that we've been learning these last couple of days. Um, then for n equals 1, there was a proof by Harpas. And I mean, I'm going to write it down in a moment. So you might say n equals 1. We did that on, like, Monday. <laughs> What's the point? Well, the point is that these are now infinity 1 categories and not just 1 categories. And there is really some non-trivial content and not that easy um, in this result. And since then, I mean, now there have been two somehow lines of attempts of proofs to say it. Uh, Concisely. So one of them is by Ayala and Francis, partly in joint work with Nick Rosenblum and Chris Shama Priest. Um, and both of them are not finished. But but there's already, I mean, if you look it up, there's already quite a lot out there. So what's the cobordism hypothesis? I told you a lot about stuff around it. So we will classify these guys. So let me write down in a short way. What are these guys? Here. We look at symmetric modular functors from board and frames to C. Um, and if you remember, uh, I said a while ago, at least for the one cob and two situation, that this actually is a groupoid. So here now, this the same is true. This is an infinity groupoid. There was an exercise trying to show you how you would go about proving this thing, at least for the <laughs> non-infinity version. Um, and so the statement will be this look very similar to the statement for n equals 1. For n equals 1, we said, well, we evaluate at a point. We can do that now. We can evaluate at a point. And remember, that actually means a little rm. And if we evaluate at a point, we land in C. Right? So the statement for n equals 1 was, well, we land in one dualizable object. We take the underlying groupoid and that's an equivalent. So we won't be taking one dualizable objects anymore, but now n dualizable objects. And then we take the underlying groupoid and the statement that this is an equivalence of infinity categories. Groupoid, sorry.
yes, the whole the whole thing. So this follows from this uh, board n having two local. Okay. Good. So uh, what does this tell us? Let's let's try to unpack this a little bit. Um, what it tells us is that well, a fully extended n-dimensional T of T is fully determined by what happens on a little R n on a little patch, right? So in physics, this you would translate to saying it's local. The theory is local. You have locality expressed, and it's fully local. Um, and that's certainly a, a, a condition that um, is very natural coming from many physical theories. Okay. So now this is a very powerful theorem. Now we can go about getting fully extended T of T's in a different way from what we did before. Namely, we can choose our favorite target and then check for this n dualizability. And so on one of the exercises, you actually checked one dualizability for a bunch of targets. So from what you did in your exercise, you immediately got a lot of one-dimensional, fully extended theories. Okay. Um, and now I'm going to tell you what n dualizable means. Right, maybe another thing is that um, what we did yesterday was we picked a very particular target, namely alg n, and we constructed something in here. Right, so the cobordism hypothesis actually, you know, we can try to do the other way. We can just take alg n and we can take what the T of T assigns to a point. Remember, that was an EN algebra. So it was factorization homology over Rn, which is just the En algebra itself. So on the other side, the En algebra gives me an object in my alg n. So, well, it must be n dualizable, right? That's what the theorem tells us. But now we can also independently prove that. So then we can basically somehow, for this particular example, compare both sides. Yes. So, so actually, what? Um, yeah, I wanted to do this later, but let's do it now because we're already talking about it. So this is a theorem by Owen, William, and myself. That says that every object in alg n is n dualizable. So I'll just write the statement of the comparison here for the ones uh, on the screen. So I should write n dualizable here, but because of that theorem, I can actually, if I'm just talking about the objects, right, um, I can actually get rid of this n dualizable because every object is n dualizable. And I mean, the way this goes is I evaluate at this little point. Um, but conversely, an object in here is an EN algebra. And for EN algebras, we were able to construct this T of T. Right. So this is the one from yesterday. Does that answer your question? Yes, so I mean, the, the Kobordism hypothesis is tells us this is equivalent, but conversely, I can also check. Because, I mean, here, on this side, um, I evaluated at a point, I get an A, but I can also go back, and that will 
that's the same PHP. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> Why do I know it's the same TFT? Uh, that's okay. That's that's a different question. Yes. Then I do need the cover with my glasses again. That is true. I mean, there would be extra work. We could also check that because basically the TFT axioms give us excision and then we characterize factorization homology because there's a characterization of factorization homology that way. Okay. So we m may or may not look at a little bit at the proof of this theorem. Um, so on the exercise, you actually had the statement for n equals one, uh, and then one can one can generalize this. But first, I would like to tell you what endu lies of law actually means. So definition. Uh, an object x in a symmetric monoidal plus infinity n category is n dualizable if well it's one dualizable so every object has a dual. So here, um, we'll unpack a little bit. Uh, I will write down step by step these conditions, and we will unpack them step by step. So I told you what it means for an object in a symmetric monoidal category to have a dual. Now we have an object in a symmetric monoidal infinity n category. The nice thing is that from an infinity n category, I can produce a category. So this will continue. I'm not done yet with this definition. And I, sh I would also like to mention this is the short version of the definition, uh, which was proven by Manuel uh, Araju in his PhD thesis. So if you look at the paper by Laurie, it looks a lot more complicated. He proved there's a every object x in C is n dualizable if, so the first condition is every object has a dual, and I'm not tell. <laughs> ah, oh, sorry, yes, thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> x is a dual, <laughs> yeah. Great. Very good, very important. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll continue with the next conditions in a moment, but I want to first make sense of this one. Okay, so um, how do we, how would we reduce this condition to one that we are familiar with? And we'll do this informally, but if you start with an infinity n category, meaning a complete n filled Siegel space, you can really make all of these things precise. And if you're interested, we can talk about it. So, so in C, we have objects. We have one morphisms, two morphisms. We have somewhere k minus one morphisms. 
I'll need those later. That's why I'm spelling them out. So if you think about how do we relate board n uh, as an infinity one category to n cob, the one that we had in the very beginning. Okay. So in board n, our morphisms as an infinity one category, morphisms were bordisms, but there was a whole space of bordisms, and that space was B diff, the diffeomorphisms. Whereas in NCOB, our morphisms were supposed to be diffeomorphism classes of bordisms. So I can go from my infinity one category to NCOB by, well, basically taking pi zero, I mean, yeah, pi zero, pi zero of the space. Trying to not get the levels wrong. <laughs> and that's exactly what we can do here. So we can take now, uh, and this will be called H1. This is an ordinary category where my objects are just the objects in C, and my morphisms are two isomorphism classes of one morphisms. or taking pi naught of the space of one morphisms. And now we're in H1 is just a category. So now I can just ask for in that H1, I have a dual. Okay, so what's our second condition? As something having uh, a dual, we have an evaluation and a correlation. So my next has a dual plus evaluation plus coevaluation. So my next condition will be that those have adjoints, left and right adjoints. So what does that mean? So you all said you know what an adjoint is. <laughs> so maybe I don't have to tell you, but you probably meant of a functor. So uh, I'll just write we'll start with an arbitrary by category. And to recover the definition that you're used to, take the by category being cats, categories, functors, and natural transformations. Okay, so here now, what's a, f I mean, usually we ask for an adjoint of a functor, a function would be one morphism. So a one morphism, are going from C to D has a left adjoint if there exists a one morphism L going the other way and two morphisms C from L composed with R to the identity on C and U going from the identity on D to the other composition such that one R, 
I can write as the identity on D composed with R. Now on the identity I can use my unit and I go to R composed L composed R or I can use my co-unit and I go back to R. I'm suppressing the extra identity. And the second condition, well, you do the same thing now in the other order. Hopefully this reminds you a little bit of that, the definition of dual eligibility that we had. And um, this can be made very precise and that will be on the exercise sheet. So great, we again have <laughs> a condition that does not work in an infinity ln category, but we know what to do for a bi category. Ah, thank you. Thank you. So, um, but the good news is we can reduce our conditions to that one. So similarly as before, from the infinity one category, we extracted a homotopy category. Should have mentioned this is symmetric monoidal. Uh, and similarly, now we can extract uh, a bi category, namely exactly here. So what's H2? Um, this is a bi category, sorry, H2, I don't want H2 of C. Uh, I want, so what I first can do is these K morphisms, now I actually pick two K minus two morphisms. And now I can take HOM in C from F to G. So this will actually be an infinity N minus K plus one category. Challenge you to get the, check the index. Um, and so from this now, I can extract a bi category with same objects and one morphisms, and the two morphisms are three iso classes of two morphisms. Question? And it, yes? I don't remember how many details of the proof we give, but we definitely um, explain this in the, the paper about Bordism, the Bordism category. So for a bi category, it's not that difficult. Proving that you get a symmetric monoidal bi category, that's the hard part. And that has not been done in the literature. Uh, you can you can do it by piecing together a lot of uh, different works, uh, mostly by Gursky, Arzorno, and their co-author, whose name I'm blanking on, Miles Johnson. Um, you can piece them it together from that, but I did not tell you what a symmetric monoidal bi category is on purpose. So for the bi category part, it's not very difficult. I thought we actually did it, but um, yeah, maybe not. Yeah. Uh, but the symmetric monoidal part, that one's annoying. Sure. Sure. Okay, good. So I know this is not rigorous, <laughs> but hopefully you can take it with a grain of salt that one can make these things precise. Um, and so now, how do we define um, 
while a morphism has an adjoint in the infinity n category, well, we extract the appropriate homotopy category. So, ah, I wanted to write that over there. call this maybe the truncation Okay, so now our left and right adjoints, they come with units and co-units. So one for each, right? So these are now two morphisms. So my next condition will be that the units and co-units, so these are now four and two, have left and right adjoints. And well, we can iterate, we can repeat that until we get to n. So the first time you see this, this is probably very confusing. <laughs> That's fully fine. Uh, maybe take the time and try to just sit down and unravel what this means until two. Uh, and, you know, the rest. Once once you really fully understand what this is for two, actually, the rest is an iterative version. Yep. So this statement, it has a dual that makes sense in a symmetric monoidal category. So that's the minimal thing we need to make sense of this, or a monoidal category, even. Whereas for the definition of having an adjoint, we need a bi category. So, in fact, they're actually both incarnations of the same thing, just as a side remark. Because it's a symmetric monoidal category, I could de loop it, look at it as an infinity n plus one category with one object, and then I just ask for adjoints everywhere. Other questions? Yeah. Yes. So if you take the infinity one category of n bordisms, then you get n cob. If we take the infinity one category of board n, then we don't have manifolds with corners. That was the very first thing that I've, I had drawn as a Siegel space. For the infinity one category, we only have one direction in which we're cutting. So we don't get corners, we just have. But here, this is the infinity n category. I was just, the statement that I made was the homotopy category of the infinity one category board n. That's different, yes. Yes, so we had on, on the first infinity something of bordisms that we had was an infinity one category. And then later we saw that infinity at least infinity two category. Yeah. That's where corners started appearing. On the n plus one level, 
I hope I didn't get my numbering wrong. <laughs> uh, so this one, yeah, this one, this one would just be dual one dualizability. And this one would be two dualizability. Uh, so here we have an object. We ha here we're asking for a morphism to have left and right adjoints. Yeah, I think I have to go to M. The same. So on all levels except for the last one, yes. So having there are these all sorts of beautiful interchange. Um, lemmas that you can do in these higher categories. Uh, so having this extra layer of dualizability implies that the adjoints one step above, actually we have the same here. But I phrased it on purpose in this like shorter, shorter way. So yeah, the left and the right adjoints are not the same here. So in the original paper by Lurie, I mean he stated you need towers of infinite length of adjoints. So, I mean, the first one would be evolution has a left and right adjoint, which themselves have left and right adjoints, which themselves have left and right adjoints, and so on. It turns out that you don't need that, that this whole tower collapses um, because of what you were saying. The left and right adjoints will agree. So this is uh, explained really well in this thesis here. Yes. Exactly. So this is a non-trivial statement. Um, this is convenient as a definition. Uh, in some sense, if you are a hardcore infinity n category person, you might want to phrase it in a definition without referring to the homotopy category and homotopy by category. And then it would be a theorem that it suffices to check it in those things. But as far as I know, that has not been worked out. Any other questions? All right, so now you can go and play the game. Pick your favorite infinity n category and try to check this condition. So we had, I mean, we had the similar scheme for n equals one already on the exercise sheet. So on the new exercise sheet, uh, there will be examples of for n equals two. We had some examples in class. We had algebras, bimodular homomorphisms. We had these spans. Um, and at least at a heuristical level, like try it out and try to try to do this. Okay, I'm gonna give me time. <coughs> there are many other good targets. Many, many, many other good targets. <laughs> uh, First of all, I mean, we can vary S quite a bit, right? Yes. We can iterate this. We can take edge one of edge one of edge one of edge one. That gives you something very fun. <laughs> so I challenge you to work out what objects are for edge one of edge one of vect. That's, well, yeah, so if this here, so if this here is infinity k, then this whole thing is infinity n plus k. So I increase, I increase the numbers. So if I take n equals one and stick in vect, then first I get a two category, then I apply ALG1, I get a three category. I apply ALG1 and I get a four category and so on. But I mean, there are also other things. So LFP that we've been looking at in Adrian's lectures, that's a great target. Okay. Or now you can combine them, ALG1 of LFP or ALG1 of PR or something like this. Um, you could try to have something where your objects are linear two categories. And then functors, natural transformations, and then we have an extra layer called modifications. So David Reuter is working on these types of things, and Theo Johnson-Fried. 
So there are many, many, many different targets that you can put here, and it's, um, it's a really important question actually to understand the zoo. <laughs> uh, for, for infinity two categories, actually, going to your question, infinity two, actually not for infinity two, but for bi category targets. There were quite a few in the literature that had been floating around. There's a nice appendix to a paper by um, Bartlett Douglas, Shoma Priest, he's been up on the board, so I'll abbreviate and Snyder. where they actually compare all these targets and show that this two dualizable part that appears in Kabordism hypothesis, that they're all the same. Oh, thank you, Vickery. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Apologies. I was on all the other papers. <laughs> That's not a naive question at all. That's a very important question. We don't know. Okay. So it would be a very important question. <laughs> <laughs> the very important question was whether there's a universal target of some sort. So, I mean, one question is what do you mean by universal, right? certainly not that easy. <laughs> so, I mean, what would you like to have? Of course, there's something that you could stick in and then every T of T comes by post-composing with that one. That's not an easy question. Um, yeah, I mean, you could put boardisms there, right? That's, <laughs> that's the tautological answer. But anything else than that? So for invertible TFTs, we didn't talk about invertible TFTs at all, but for invertible TFTs, there is an affirmative answer to this. So um, Fried and Hopkins um, have, have shown or have argued that um, is a universal target for invertible TFTs, which is a nice spectrum called the Anderson dual of the sphere spectrum. I see star, so sig shift of that. Can anybody answer that question? So the question was, what happens if we put C equals board M in the cobordism hypothesis? Hmm? Almost. You get board N, but the underlying infinity group with. So, nope. <laughs> so it was on the last year's exercise sheet to show for board two that any object is two dualizable. So now you know what two dualizable means. Now you can go and prove it. <laughs> but yeah, so f in, in board N, any object is N dualizable. And this is not obvious. This is something you actually have to think about. And it's really at the heart of the statement. I mean, that's really why the image will be N dualizable. So to show that this is a well defined functor, you have to show that the point here is N dualizable. Yes. universal so question is is there a universal source for TFTs that comes from E and algebras? So the question is if I have some TFT, how can I prove that it comes from a traditional homology? Homology lands in Alg N. I 
don't know. I mean, I would like to say, take something like AlgN of n manifolds, which we talked about yesterday, yeah. which may or may not be equivalent to board n. <laughs> but uh, I mean, because factorization homology gives you a functor from manifolds and symmetric monoidal to whatever s you choose, so now you can just apply AlgN to it. So you certainly, factorization homology will also give you a functor from alg n of n manifolds to alg n of s. I th yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is a question that Greg Gineau asked like a couple of years ago and we have fun brainstorming <laughs> this evening about this um, with Hiro Tanaka and some others. So yeah, it's, it's a question for everybody. What are EN algebras in n-manifolds, framed n-manifolds? I don't know. Okay, great. So this was more of a philosophical discussion now or kind of understanding the statement of the cobordism hypothesis. So maybe maybe uh, it's worth mentioning a little bit more about this here. But rather than give you the proof, so by the way, um, if you look at this paper, for n equals two, we drew a lot of pictures explaining this. So <coughs> you already know sort of what this thing is. Ah, uh, thank you. So here, I mean, we talked about it in detail for alg1. Those were factorization algebras on R on 0, 1 with some properties. And for alg2, you take factorization algebras on 0, 1 squared with some properties. Um, and, and now to prove this, on a very heuristic level, there are a couple of very pretty pictures you can just draw, and these are string diagrams or similar arguments to this, like snake is the same as straight, so I do encourage you to actually now go and just look at the pictures, and hopefully you will appreciate the picture. Um, but what I would like to mention here is, well, we said, there's an infinite, this is actually infinity n plus k. And now our statement is about n dualizability, right? But what about n plus one? What about n plus two dualizability? Right. Um, and so here's a problem. Uh, this is basically part two of the theorem. So maybe let me call this A, and this is B. that in alg n of s using factorization algebra, so what we saw yesterday, if a is n plus one dualizable, then n is just the unit so that's very unsatisfactory. Um, and the reason are the pointings that I did not mention this morning. Factorization algebras have pointings coming from including empty sets into whatever. So this is, this is very unsatisfactory at this point. Um, and tells us that factoriz this factorization model for algen is, is nice for the topological field theory application of factorization algebras, uh, factorization homology. But if we want to actually have high dualizability, n plus one, n plus two, n plus three, and so on, 
we need to do something else. So you saw essentially the essential kind of core of why this is true uh, was an exercise, namely already in vector spaces and pointed vector spaces. If you take pointed vector spaces, the only dualizable object is K, the ground field. So having these points really changes a lot about the dualizability. So we would need to modify alt n of s. Um, or use, I mentioned there's this other version. So I, uh, you can use that version um, plus the n will work. But nevertheless, to still to, to, to have the possibility to get higher dualizability, to get possibly n plus one, n plus two, n plus k dualizability. So then we would want to get functors for n plus 1 framed to alt n of s, or for n plus 2 framed to the same type, and so on. Yes, exactly. So if we're taking board n to alg n, uh, like coming from this n dualizability, we're not seeing a lot of the category. We're only seeing the infinity n part of the category, but not the higher. We're forgetting. We're forgetting all morphisms in S, basically. Uh, no, we really need the morphism next to define what EN algebras are. But, so let me do an example. Maybe this makes it more clear. Okay. Let me do the example of n equals 1. So, uh, if A is an E1 algebra, what the theorem tells us is that we get a functor from board 1 framed to alg, which are algebras and prime modules. Alg, actually, we also have this as a two category, where now we have objects are algebras. We have morphisms are bimodules. And two morphisms are homomorphisms. I hope this was one of the examples when we were talking about bicategories. <laughs> so instead, we can ask for two dimensional TFTs.
Das ist weg. Think of it as an infinity one category, yes, or just as a one category. So alge of vect is just the alge that we've been looking at. Um, so it's an infinity two category, exactly. But if I look at functors from board one into this thing, I only see the algebras and bimodules, and be completely precise isomorphisms of bimodules because it's an infinity one category, as you say. So this is the part that I always get from any algebra. That's an analog analogous statement of this one here. So for any algebra, I get a TFT like this. But I do not always get a two-dimensional TFT will be an extra finiteness condition. Okay, so why did I want to tell you about this? Let's do the same thing for n equals 2. And now for s being categories, or if you want the LFP that Adrien has been talking about. So now the theorem. Oh, thank you. So the theorem, now, so my objects in ALG2 of LFP are braided monoidal linear categories. So in particular, we had in Adrian's class rep G and rep QG. Those were the two prime examples. Right. So what he did, now we can compute factorization homology, right? So I call this A, as I think it was in last class. We can compute factorization homology over all surfaces. But also, our theorem tells us this is an E2 algebra, and uh, A is two dualizable. And by the cobordism hypothesis, that means we get a fully extended 2D TFT. or two framed, two alg2 of LFP, given by taking factorization homology. That was yesterday's construction. Uh, and
And now we can ask, do I get even a 3D TFT or even a 4D TFT? Because ALG2 of LFP is an infinity four category. And well, I mean, these are really things that you would want to have um, for various other reasons where Adelian is a better person to speak about. Um, and the answer is yes, if. And there's some extra conditions. And for instance, there was this rigid up on the board. Okay. So this was A. Don't have anything else. You can only ask for A to be rigid. <laughs> sense that we uh, just under learned. So we know it's uh, it's three dualizable it's three dualizable if A is rigid, it's four dualizable if it's uh, a braided fusion category. Is that right? Did I hmm? enough projectives, yes, thank you. Okay, so I just wanted to give this as an outlook <coughs> on um, other settings where dualizability might be because this algen setting is sometimes a bit misleading in the beginning because, well, everything is n-dualizable. But it's actually non-trivial to go up and go further, and those will be actual finiteness conditions that start appearing. Yes. There's this sentence here. We need to modify Algen or use Runa's version. Yes. No. I, I mean, I didn't tell you how to. I did. Yeah. I didn't tell you how to, but um, if you modify it a little bit, just want to, you know, warn you that there are some subtleties there. I don't want to make it easier than it actually is. So I just wanted to warn you that there are some subtleties that you have to take care of. No, no, no. The, the theorem GS just gives me two dualizabilities. Oh, okay. And this is fine, right? Yeah. This is still fine. But now, this is just. Ah, thank you. Great. <laughs> uh, right, so th this, this up to here, everything is OK with the alge that you know now after this class. But now, for this question here, you actually have to do something. And there's some work involved. Uh, and then one can actually give an affirmative answer. Yes, it's an affirmative answer in terms of dualizability. What they show is uh, three and four dualizable. And it's actually really, I mean, you don't know what the 3D TFT does. I mean, you do, on, you do very easily on certain three manifolds and four manifolds, namely those that come from the dualizability data. So in principle, you know it everywhere, but in practice, piecing that together, it's not like I just, you know, it's easy to just write down a formula. Is it easy in that particular case? It's not, right? <laughs> no. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you should get back these for everybody. In three dimensions, you should get the scan modules that, well, Adri are at least related to what Adrian was talking about. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I hope this was end was not too confusing. I just wanted to tie up the two <laughs> a little bit more and kind of tell you how it compares to what we saw in the other class. Um, and that, well, checking these dualizability conditions uh, for many situations is indeed easier than just writing down the TFT, but it's still not, I mean, there's still something actual to do. Um, and it's in particular, if you want to understand what the TFT does in fall, just from the dualizability itself, you won't know it. So that's the nice thing about factorization homology in those cases, that it really tells you what to do on all uh, manifolds. Um, so, yes, I mean, it would be nice, of course, if everything arose that way, but it doesn't. <laughs> okay, to finish up, I would just like to mention that that might sound like it's enough, right? I mean, we define TFTs, we have a classification. Principle, now I can write down everything, right? But life is not so fair. <laughs> Math is not so fair. <laughs> to cite Natalie. <laughs> uh, and sometimes, sometimes this framework just isn't the right one. So I, I told you this framework as saying like, this is it, right? There are examples from physics that just don't fit into this framework. So it's not like, I just don't want you going out and saying like, oh, this is everything, right? But depending on your situation, depending on your theory, you might actually have to modify what are the bordisms. You, obviously, we've already seen you can choose diff many different things here. Um, sometimes they're just not symmetric monoidal functors. Sometimes there's something more complicated than that. Yes? Let's, let's talk about that after. I just want to finish up here. <laughs> so, so there are various modifications that one might like to do, in particular also modifications for getting access to non-topological things. Or you might want to be able to include like things like group actions, gauge theory, and so on. So um, I just want to end, end, end with this to tell you, I mean, this is not the end, right? There's many things to explore now and to do now. Um, and yeah. Factorization homology might, you know, there are also variants of that and hopefully versions that you can do with this or adapt. Um, and factorization homology as an idea, as a conceptual idea, right, is a really important tool. But sometimes you actually need to work around, do that in practice, um, not, not just to apply the framework. All right. Thank you very much for, for being here and for taking part. This afternoon in the exercises, uh, you get to play around with end realizability. Uh, uh, questions first? Yeah, questions first. Yes. Please ask your question. Vary the n of the. So. Yes. Partially extended, you mean? Like not going all the way down to the point. There are partial results. Um, so well, <laughs> we saw for a one category of one cob one category of two cob. So for the ordinary categories, there are the statements. For infinity one categories of those settings, for n equals one, that's Harpus's result. For n equals two, I think there is not. Um, there is a result if you look at three to one extended situation as a bi category. That was done in that paper by the four authors that maybe was erased now. Bartlett, Douglas, Shama, Priest, and Vickery. Um, 
and you, you get modular tensor objects. So if you are working in categories, you get exactly modular tensor categories. But aside from that, at present, I mean, in principle, you can repeat what um, Bartlett Chalmer Priest Vickery did, like going up one step, but then translating it into a tractable condition is the problem. You will get like, I mean, even in their result getting modular tensor objects in something, um, their first version, like the, what their machine does, you first get like something crazy like, I don't know, I don't remember the number, but like 40 generators and 120 relations, like huge things, right? And then they have to work to make this into something that you actually <laughs> understand. So in principle, you can do your machine in any like bi-category situation, but getting something meaningful is the problem. Um, what else is there? There's open closed situation. <laughs> so Adelaide's remark was there on math overflow there is exactly this question, and Lori's answer was basically uh, explaining why this is a really hard problem. Yes. Sorry, can you say that again? Uh -huh. Yes. Can I pass on the question? <laughs> Maybe I should come here so people hear what you say. Yeah, I mean, if, if, uh, if X is the classifying state of the group, then uh, Torais has a version of GFT homotopy on GFT ranges and calls it. Um, and I mean, there are also classification and construction as well. If it's in two dimension, construction in three dimension, not a full classification though. Again, in this equivariant case for the for um for finite groups, right? Yeah, for finite groups. And I mean, maybe I'm not entirely sure whether this is the, your question, but there's also for the borders and hypothesis, there's also a structure state. Um, Can you speak up? I can't hear you. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. factorization homology works for any tangential structure. Yeah, <laughs> um, so in particular also maps to a space X. Yes. So the question is, can I give a rough explanation of how to modify alg n to get this. So the easy answer is uh, use what I wrote here. Am I on the right board? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> the easy answer is use what I wrote here. Um, use the combination of Runa Hauksang's model for the Morita category uh, and then the extension by Theo and I to get the higher morphisms because this is an unpointed version, and then it just works. Um, the, but, but, but this here looks, I mean, this is not what I explained to you this week, right? I mean, <laughs> this uses very different methods. This does not use factorization um, algebras and stuff. In particular, this theorem also is suitably written for the factorization model. Um, and yeah, more technical things we can talk later. <laughs> yes. Free 
asymmetric monoidal on one dualizable object, one n dualizable object. Yes. <laughs> so the question was. Um, a reformulation of the statement is to say that board n frames is the free symmetric monoidal infinity n category generated by one n dualizable object. So it seems very weird that this n category would depend on real numbers as being the basis of manifolds um, or manifolds in general <laughs> uh, and whether there is more of a syntactical version of this, right? To me, that's beauty, to be honest. <laughs> um, if you say free symmetric monoidal infinity n category generated by one n dualizable object, in principle, that means that you have pasting patterns and you can piece them together any way you want and do that freely. That's a combinatorial nightmare. And to me, like actually, to be honest, the fact that you can rephrase that in terms of something as simple as manifolds based on real numbers, that's really the strength of this theorem. So I don't know, <laughs> but I'm not sure it would really be helpful. Um, I mean, for low dimensions, maybe it would be helpful. But for higher dimensions, I'm not sure. I mean, it won't be easier than this, I think. Thank you. <laughs> we have to accept the real number somehow. Uh, I mean, I'm willing to do that. <laughs> I mean, the thing is that, I mean, what really is behind this really is this, this, this thing that when you draw things like adjoints, what we really want to draw are these string diagrams. So you can think of these things as more complicated string diagrams. And to be able to draw something, I probably need the real numbers. <laughs> 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 but I mean, so Jamie Vickery and uh, co-author, some of his PhD students, um, David, former PhD students, David Reuter and um, I'm blanking on the name. Can you help me? The other PhD student that Chris, Chris, Christoph, no, the other one, Christoph, I'm blanking on his name. I'll mention it later. Um, so they're working towards kind of having uh, versions of infinity n categories that are, you know, more like putting them in, able to put them in computers and stuff. So I would go and talk to them and ask them in that direction. Christoph. Oh, I'm so bad with names. I'm sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Everybody happy? Great. Let's go have, well, let's thank <laughs> Adrien. Come up, come up. <laughs> Maybe come to the middle. <laughs> yes, this week has been fantastic. And thank you both. Thank you for making this happen. Thank you all for coming. And uh, thank you also to Jan, obviously. He's not here. Yeah. <laughs> in particular with all these complications and all the annoying emails I sent you. So thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. so for everybody in Zoom, thanks for having this camera and joining in. And hope to see you at some point in person. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.